area though that where we see people starting to worry is automotive as you said and then that branches into two areas one of them is the the power handling um, where as you've said the voltages are going higher um, you know we're thinking of silicon carbide components uh, that'll be 600 a thousand volts uh, the currents are really high uh, the other area is in uh, autonomous uh, driving where essentially you've got the electronics of a jet fighter at the uh, <laughs> mounted inside your car you've got lidar and radar and high-speed communication and what we're seeing there is that the risk of voids is now being taken really seriously because it'll change the impedance of the circuit sufficiently that it's not consistent anymore so whereas people were pretty casual about voids for you know the first 35 40 years of, of surface mount now it, it here's an application where it really matters my guest today has worked in the automotive industry with both general motors and chrysler in 1987 he joined the family business as ceo of heller industries Heller Industries is a manufacturer of soldering and curing machines serving the electronic assembly and semiconductor packaging industries. Heller is truly an international company with locations in New Jersey, Korea, and China. And if you haven't guessed it, my guest is David Heller. David has a BS in mechanical engineering from Cornell University and an MBA from Harvard. He currently serves on the board of directors of a number of technology and medical startup and growth companies. And best of all, he's my guest today as we talk about all things reflow next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome, Dave Heller. Thanks for being my guest today. Mike, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Well, thanks again. Thanks to you. Heller Industries was founded in 1960, which is the year I was born. Over the past 10 months, I've had experts on the show discussing board fabrication, thermal management, solder paste printing, x-ray, and virtually everything that surrounds reflow. We've talked about everything before the oven and everything after the oven. And then I realized that we've completely circled reflow technology. So I wanted to bring in an expert to discuss the reflow process. And I have to admit, the first name that came to mind was Heller. I, I realized that there are many manufacturers of reflow ovens uh, today, but to me, Heller seemed like the generic name like Coca-Cola or Xerox. I guess that's the benefit of being in business just a few weeks shy of 60 years. Yeah, we're gonna have a big party come June. I can imagine, I can imagine. Um, I understand Heller was founded in 1960, and can you tell me what led to the founding of Heller Industries? And given the fact that surface mount was at least 20 years into the future, what was Heller's primary product right. back then? Well, the, the story was interesting. My father wrote a story about this nascent growth comp industry when he was in high school, and he was all interested in electronics. So when he graduated from engineering school in 1951, he went to work for General Electric in their training program and wound up um, at uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, Evendale, Ohio, making jet engines, but then in uh, Syracuse, New York, where they were doing electronic assembly. And half the group on Electronics Highway uh, was uh, military, the other half was uh, 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 commercial. And they were just at the beginning of the industry and figuring out everything for the first time. So while he was there, he came up with a drag solder machine, um, not knowing that there was such a thing as a wave solder and experimented with solder fountains and ultimately with a, uh, a lead prep machine uh, for uh, manual insertion of, uh, of components since there were no auto insertion machines at that time. It's funny you say drag solder machine. My first entry into this industry, which was in 1985, um, your company was already 25 years old by then, uh, was in drag soldering machines. I We, we built and sold drag soldering machines uh, at the oh. very tail end of through hole. Uh, and, you know, yep. surface mount was being talked about and, you know, we tried to figure out ways we could dunk a surface mount component into a pool of solder. And, and obviously that wasn't very successful. But certainly drag soldering machines were great for through-hole technology, particularly yeah, long-leaded yeah. through-hole technology, where you tended to yep. solder the boards and cut the leads later. 
Right. Right. Or solder cut solder. If uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of the what were some of the big Ziva Tech? I think was one of the yes. bigger names and yes. drag soldering machines back in the day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know after. GE uh, Syracuse, my father went to work for a company in New Jersey called Blonder Tongue, and they were taking this new surf uh, uh, printed circuit board technology for commercial work, and that's where he developed um, the series of lead prep machines and then decided to go out on his own and make uh, lead prep equipment, and that's that was our core business through the mid-1980s, and then with the advent of surface mount, I had joined the company from the auto industry, and we, we decided we had to do something in surface mount, pick and place look kind of complicated and scary and printers yeah too mechanical but but ovens that looked interesting because they, they got hot so that's how we uh, evolved into the oven business interesting well we'll get more into that in a few minutes um i've interviewed a few ceos that kind of took over their family business from their fathers and each of them have shared stories on this on this show of, of their younger days at the family business right. performing some of the least desired <laughs> functions like sweeping the floor, <laughs> drilling through holes, you know, in, in bare boards. Were you subject to that rite of passage as well? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I had to uh, go through a hazing process. I started as a vice president of agriculture by cutting the lawns on Saturday. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the good advantage is I learned how to drive a riding mower. So when it was time to get my driver's license, I already kind of knew what I was doing. Um, and uh, then went to work in the machine shop, uh, you know, between on holidays or when uh, you know, I wasn't in at school. Um, and, uh, you know, one summer worked in the machine shop. So had, had some background in, uh, in machining as well. When I was a kid, you know, one of my chores was to mow the lawn. And, you know, I grew up in California. We don't have large swaths of land, you know, that houses are built on like other parts of the country. And I think uh, the house was about 1200 square feet. It was probably on a quarter acre lot. And I remember desperately trying to talk my dad into buying a John Deere riding <laughs> mower. I don't even think I can make a U-turn with it, but, but, you know, and stay on the lawn. But uh, yeah, I think I would have been much more um, eager to cut the lawn if I could ride a machine rather than, than push something. Yeah. Yeah. So what other things did you do there um, as, as you, what age were you when you started working uh, at Heller Industries? Well, my last, well, um, I worked after uh, engineering, I worked for General Motors for a while and then uh, worked with my father for a little bit, uh, then went back to grad school and uh, worked at Chrysler. And then after Chrysler, I came back full time. So that was in 87. I was 28. So you worked before college and uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, yeah. and then you work after <laughs> yeah. college. Your, your, uh, your college is very impressive. You have an MS um, in uh, mechanical engineering from Cornell, not too shabby, and an MBA from Harvard, not too shabby. Yeah. I, I imagine yeah. that may have come in handy. Did your father have the, the same uh, credentials or, or was he? Yeah, uh, he was a mechanical engineer and, and essentially finished his MBA at night. Um, you know, when he was in that GE training program be, so between Syracuse University and University of Maryland. So, all very good. Um, that may explain why your company's been around for 60 years. So, let's talk about reflow ovens. Reflow ovens have been around since uh, I, I think around the 80s, uh, yeah, as I yeah. remember. And can you tell me how they've changed over the years in order to overcome technical challenges throughout the years? And let's begin with the earliest ovens that you can recall? Can you describe them? Right. You know, in the early days, there were really two, alter now, let's say two alternates. Um, one was to use IR, and that would have been either a medium wave, the old uh, Vitronics panel machines, or short wave, which was the uh, older RTC uh, furnaces. And really, the RTC machine was a high temperature furnace that was descaled for surface mount. Um, and there were challenges with each. Um, the RTCs, had the challenge that you couldn't measure temperature directly. You had to measure it indirectly. Um, and keeping keeping the process under control was difficult because the lamps were happy full on or full off, but modulating them was tough. Just a really hairy uh, control algorithm problem. Uh, IR panels were more gentle and easier to control. The challenge there was with heavy load. When you would have uh, very heavy load particularly uh, in the middle of the panel where the thermocouple was located, the edges would tend to overheat and you would have uniformity problems uh, under load. But also when when the industry started using PLCCs, 
it was real hard to get the component uh, uniformly heated. Uh, so you'd have a, a large thermal mass with your PLCC and a, you know, your, your R's and C's would overheat and you could generate 10, 15 degree deltas if you weren't careful. You could always slow down the process, but then you're, you'd lose control of your time above liquidus. So there were two companies, um, uh, SPT and Heller, who first started building these forced convection machines, the SPT first. Um, and uh, that was clearly a better way to go uh, to, to have the best uniformity, the most gentle heating, uh, the best delta T. And it was pretty clear that that was an advantage. And ultimately, uh, all the other companies um, started producing these force convection machines as well. Uh, in parallel, we always had the vapor phase machines, but uh, the challenge there was operating economy because the floor inert was expensive. And yeah. the other challenge, of course, was uh, that they're essentially batch up machines. So throughput um, was a challenge. But if you've got a super heavy thermal mass, uh, and horrendous uh, disuniformity of thermal mass. It, it, it always worked, and it still is a reasonable solution. Uh, but you know, that's the uh, a fringe solution, maybe a one or two percent of uh, the market. Yeah, I've I've uh, seen it. I, I don't want to say comeback. That's way over exaggerated. But I you know I I travel a lot and I see a lot of factories. Uh, and and in the last year or two, I've seen a couple. Probably no more than yeah. two um, uh, newer installations of vapor phase, and uh, it, I guess it's just for the the fringe technologies that uh, where, where the conventional technologies just are good but not good enough for a really challenging application. You know, the the place where it really makes sense is in very low volume and typically military uh, assemblies. That's exactly where, where I saw it. Yeah. 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 Because they don't, they don't, you know, if each circuit board is very, very expensive and you're only given a kit with enough that, uh, that you have to produce them all, you can't afford to have a profile board. Um, so everyone has to work. It has to be perfect. You, you can't profile. Um, and that's, uh, a reasonable application for vapor phase. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. there's another advantage too that most of these vapor phase machines now uh, come with vapor recovery. They've basically got a vacuum chamber at the end where they uh, evaporate off all the solvent, and that acts as a devoiding station, uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it helps with void uh, minimization. I would imagine it's given the size of Heller, uh, it, that's probably too small a market for Heller to pursue. Is that is that correct? You know. Uh, the ultimate question is, do our customers w need it? Um, and every now and then we'll have a survey and talk to people. And our typical customers are not looking for that product. Right. Uh, there are a couple brands uh, made in Europe and they're, they're good machines. But, you know, uh, our guys are, uh, are, are rarely looking for that kind of solution. Right. We, we battle that in our business building cleaning systems where someone will want something rather custom and, and, you know, a salesman never, never likes to say no. Right? So they, they come Absolutely. marching into my office going, I got this great idea. And then when we kind of, you know, we, we play it out and, and, and kind of pro forma it. And, and we realized that if we could say yes, instead of no, we'd sell maybe two extra machines a year or, you know, it's, yeah. it's like asking Ford to build uh, a Taurus six inches longer. You know, they're, they're exactly they're, the cost of doing that is, is, outrageous and and the return on that is, is virtually non-existent so it's it, probably good to let the fringe players do what they do well and yes and concentrate on the kind of the 80 20 rule right you know yes the, the hardest thing is to say no we, yeah. we rarely do that <laughs> yeah well i <laughs> i've said this in other episodes i think but um we've learned over 27 years in business that sometimes the word no is way more profitable than the word yes oh and, yeah and absolutely but, but that's hard that's hard to convey to get the troops to kind of buy into that, that philosophy. Right. Right. So like, like many other high tech products, while the product may be able to physically function, their usefulness may become obsolete over time. And I can think of like a computer or a mobile phone. If someone gave me a first generation MacBook, uh, it would be completely useless today with today's applications and today's speed requirements. And, and the same could be said if someone gave me the first generation Blackberry, um, so in that context, if, for example, a contract manufacturer was in the market 
uh, say a brand new contract manufacturer. They don't have any equipment. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing they do is go out to the used market and, and look for something cheap and, you know, useful, um, operative word being useful. Uh, what, in your opinion, would be the minimum features and capabilities that you'd recommend on any, any brand of oven? You know, what should people right. look for um, today to be useful today? Uh, I think there's a, a number of issues that are generally settled in the industry. Um, the first one would be how many zones do you really need to get a decent uh, no lead profile and have some flexibility? And in general, five would be the smallest, but often people will, you know, think around seven. Um, I would say that ten is the typical number. Um, and the issue of mesh belt and edge hold, I would say most people are you know, it, going with mesh with, with edge hold. But if you can buy a machine with both, it just makes it a little more flexible. The the real question is nitrogen, and uh, nitrogen is is a little bit like fashion. Um, if you go to certain parts of Asia, everybody just runs nitrogen. It's what you do. But in America, far less. Uh, because in America, we, we tend to water wash, we clean after. So we do use maybe a little bit different uh, philosophy, maybe more aggressive flux. But uh, the, the fraction of people using nitrogen in the U.S. Is, is more modest. And as a result, I would say somebody starting out, that would be one area that you wouldn't have to uh, go for the uh, most expensive solution. A simple air machine would probably be fine. Right. I remember when lead free first um, emerged on the scene and, and there was a huge talk of nitrogen and and going to shows, I'd see, you know, nitrogen generation machines, you know, so you right. didn't have to rent right. the tanks and, and all that. that. That was that was the big talk back then. But it looks like it kind of settled out a little bit. Um, and I think your point of, of cleaning is uh, is well taken in Asia where, you know, the major production is, lies. Um there's not a lot of cleaning going on in Asia because they have this huge economy of scale and they can, they can, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, Foxconn is, is taking every iPhone board and running it through a, you know, an inline cleaner or a batch cleaner. Um, they have yeah. the ability, unlike us mere mortals, you know, they can build, you know, 10 million of something every month and, and they can not only design for manufacturability, they can design uh, for non cleanability or whatever it is they want to eke out of the process to, to uh, capture some more profit. Yeah, that makes perfect sense that, you know, nitrogen would be more common there and less common here where we're building smaller batch sizes and typically, or, or at least more typically today, cleaning um, than, yeah. than was in the yeah. past. There's a term that I like to use and I call it an evolution cycle. And that's um, a cycle when products evolve to the point where they provide a substantial new set of capabilities or features. So hypothetically, and if an if an equipment manufacturer's de if an equipment manufacturer debuts a a new oven every two years, there may not be a substantially new capability set or feature set every two years. You know, model on model, perhaps it might take three to five model changes to evolutionize the capabilities. Um, an example that comes to mind is uh, going back to, again the iPhone. You know, the first iPhone was revolutionary. The second right. model was probably quite evolutionary. Maybe even the third model was evolutionary. But today's uh, iPhones, um, every two years when they, or every year when they come out with one, uh, really are not evolutionary anymore. They might have a few added pixels on the camera. They might have a slightly faster processor or make the packages in new colors. Uh, but But not every new model is evolutionary. So that brings up two questions. Uh, one, what is the evolution cycle on reflow ovens with substantial new features and capabilities? And uh, is that evolution cycle speeding up or slowing down? I think that we could see early in the market, uh, you know, early in the life of our industry, let's say in the 80s and 90s, the evolution was rapid. Um, we were all learning what worked and what didn't work. Um, and now that evolution is uh, on a more moderate uh, pace. But I think we're still evolving. Uh, we are, you know, I would say in our company, every, uh, let's say, five years, we'll come up with a new model where the, uh, th that is no longer backward compatible. 
with what right. we have been building. So we'll give it a new uh, moniker, but um, we'll have a, a very significant number of uh, design changes. It's variations on a theme, but in all ways incrementally better. We do a lot of special machines and that creates learning. And then we gather up all of that learning, revisit what we our standard product and say, you know, we can make this better, either more reliable or takes a lot of cost out and, and bring value to the customer. Um, so what we'll do is every five years, we'll have a new uh, uh, platform and continue to evolve continuously uh, through the life of that platform. And what's unbelievable to me is we've been making these machines for a long time now, you know, 25, 30 years, and we're still taking about 5% of the cost out per year. And when we do that, we're typically improving the performance, whether it's cross belt uniformity, um, lower temperature deltas uh, under the center board support, straighter center board support, lower nitrogen consumption, uh, ease of building. Uh, you would think that it would peter out, but somehow or another, we 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 keep on going, and we have one. What, I have one more generation in my head, <laughs> so there's a, a good five years worth of innovation left for th for that product line at a at a minimum. Oh, very good. And, and you know the thing that we're looking at and just kind of wondering when it's going to happen. When will the issues of global warming and power consumption start filtering down to uh, circuit board assembly? And when are they going to come to us and say? All right, we need your oven to reduce power consumption by 75%. Uh, you know, mm. water washing and ovens, that's where the energy is. And, you know, when are we both going to get uh, tagged and have to seriously evolve the design again for low power consumption? Yeah, there's in our business, it, it's it, because we build batch machines, it's not a big power issue, but we, we've seen that environmental consciousness awakening um, yep. with regard to what goes down the drain. Our first machines sent everything down the drain. You know, we weren't putting CFCs up the stack. So we thought we were the green guys, right? So we were just putting dirty water down the drain. And then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden people said, okay, fine. You know, the ozone's safe now. What's going down the drain? And, and we had to evolve and, and create new technology that didn't put anything down the drain. And then, you know, being in California where we either have, uh, uh, well, we have a, constant state of no water and, and wind and fire. And, you know, right now, today, my state is on fire. Um, yes. so, so there's a big concern over water consumption and, um, you know, the, the amounts that we used of water that we bragged about 20 years ago, and we only used 12 gallons a load or, you know, which, which seemed amazingly low. Now people are critiquing that. And, and for two reasons, one is they're either environmentally conscious and, and want to do the right thing to make a better world for their grandkids, et cetera. And there's another group that, you know, finds it to be financially advantageous um, to conserve uh, because it saves money. It, it, it prohibits fines and, and, you know, inspectors walking up their pipes and things like yes. that. So I always say that people chase two greens, either the envir environmental green or the currency green. Either way, the result drives uh, more efficient processes and, and yes. more environmentally responsible processes, regardless of the motivation that the customer has. Yes, I agree. So uh, some of the past reflow challenges included – uh, as I recall, and I'm no expert on reflow, but from what I could see from the uh, the cheap seats, uh, was the switch to lead free. That was big because it requires higher reflow temperatures, and and at least in the beginning, uh, the use of inert atmospheres. What are the some What are some of the challenges today in reflow that that we're seeing more now? You know, what's the next lead free to shake up right. the, the uh, reflow business? I think the perennial concern is service and service interval. Uh, and trying to minimize the uh, amount of downtime that can be expected with the with the machine, so flux management is always a, a big issue, uh, and ease of cleaning, uh, reliability is a given. They, you know, we, we you just assume that the machine once installed will will act will work reliably for for years, um, and you know I think that. 
certain aspects of performance then become the next issue. Uh, can you uh, provide low nitrogen consumption and uh, low power consumption uh, in, in a given uh, machine size? Uh, occasionally people will compete on, on delta T on a test board, but in general, um, most machines are good enough these days. So uh, the, the one that really comes out, particularly in the high throughput uh, Asian customers is uh, service interval and then ease of service. Mm -hmm. Right. They would kind of want to plug and play and forget about it yep. for as long yep. as possible. So we went through a phase in this industry, I'm sure you recall it even more than I do, um, where and I'm just kind of speaking in generalities here, where one Chinese manufacturer would build either a reflow oven or a wave soldering machine or a conveyor, and it was sold by a dozen different companies, uh, private labor right. under their own name, each company undercutting the price of their competitor who sold the exact same machine. And in that scenario, um, there was little, if any, uh, differentiation from product to product. Is there an advantage this is kind of a, a, a softball question because I obviously there is an advantage. But I, what what I want to hear is you know what are the advantages of selecting any type of equipment, not just reflow, uh, from the manufacturer directly as opposed to right. you know some private label deal where um, the, the market is flooded with uh, with cheap products uh, that right and they may not have a direct link to the actual manufacturer. I, I would say, fortunately for us, that business model was absolutely not sustainable. Um, and it it is not necessarily because of the hardware. It's because of the different organization behind the hardware. Right. And should there be, be a problem um, and you're talking to a distributor who really has no ability to service the product, you're you're in bad shape. And if you as a process engineer have specced in a machine that can't be serviced adequately and the factory is down because of your decision, it's a career ender. And very quickly, people got the word that while you could buy a very inexpensive uh, machine uh, from a, uh, a general distributor, if there were problems, and because these machines were new to North America, there were, then you were uh, in deep uh Deep trouble. Mm -hmm. So the way the market evolved is that all of the domestics started building their machines in uh, China. And so the cost of manufacture was not that different between the local brands and the, uh, the, the U.S. companies operating there. And the price advantage was modest. And the support difference was enormous. Um, so it wasn't just machine support. It was process support. It was the ability to speak a, a, the same language, uh, to be in the same time zone, to have rapid access to repair and parts. So again, the non-machine issues dominated and really helped us maintain uh, our market share. Sure. I think um, it probably sounds Pollyannish, but uh, but I, I do believe that the best experience is buy direct from the manufacturer. I mean, obviously you go through distribution, that doesn't change it. You still have access to the manufacturer. and because the manufacturer is really a partner uh, with yes. with their customer, even though that sounds like a cliche, sounds like some Fifth Avenue, you know, marketing thing, but it's true. And, yes. you know, I've seen, I've seen, you know, probably about 15 years ago, I saw the start of the commoditization of, of assembly equipment. And these are not commodities. These are, these are right. highly engineered devices, complex devices that, you know, the, the better engineered they are, the easier they are to operate, but there's still a lot of technology behind any type of assembly equipment, whether it's pick and place, reflow, printing, you know, even conveyors. And when I saw conveyors flood the market, I'm like, okay, well, I can see that. I, I, don't, I don't have a great appreciation for the complexity of a, uh, you know, of a conveyor. But when I started to see it happen with reflow ovens and printers and other type cleaners, even, and other types of, of products, it, it really made me worry because it, it kind of, pollutes the entire market and, um, and sets this, this expectation of such a low price, which as you said, is not sustainable for any, any length right. of time. It, I think yeah. it's dangerous for the community actually. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, the, uh, 
there were a few people when I started in the industry who I really admired. Uh, John Pomeroy, who ran Dover's Electronics Group, mm -hmm. uh, was one. And we talked about this trend and this issue. And I was young, and, and but he had been around a long time. And he explained, look, it's going to be painful, but it's not sustainable. And so we'll all, we'll get through this, we'll live. And uh, people, the industry will figure it out really quickly. Because if you buy a cut rate piece of equipment and it goes down and you can't support it, you got a world of hurt. So right. uh, the industry figured it out very quickly. Yeah, it, it usually does. It's just a, a painful lesson that, that, you know, you sit on the sidelines and you can predict it, but no one's going to believe you until they actually experience yep. it. Yep. yep. My father used to be a computer programmer, you know, way back in the day before there were personal computers. And, you know, their, his company all bought IBM. That was pretty much the only player on the market, you know, IBM. And their tagline back in the 60s and 70s was you know you, you'll you might pay a lot of money but you'll never get fired for buying one of our machines you know because <laughs> it's true it, you had this yes. this behemoth company behind it and and yes. and supporting it and i think the same lessons apply today you know if you can yes. it's not all about price it's about value it's about support it's yes. about it's about shipping your products reliably uh not yep. um not cutting out every penny um you know uh, if people don't realize how costly it is to have products in the field that are not reliable. It's way more expensive to fix something than it is to build it right. Yes, yes. You know, a lot of what we do also winds up being uh, semi-custom. Uh, so people will have an unusual requirement, and we're more than happy to, to do that. Uh, you can't do that out of a catalog with a distributor. Uh, that has to go direct to the factory. Right. Uh, and it, it has become a larger part of our business as well. Right. And sometimes you have to tell a customer, you know, with today's technology, that can't be done, you know, and, and rather than someone that just going back to our former discussion, you can't just say yes all the time and then try and figure it out after you get the purchase order. Right. Although that does happen too. <laughs> well, we've, we've done that. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking I'm a little bit hypocritical when I say that because we've, you know, in our early days, we're like, yeah, sure. In fact, we say yes before the question is even finalized. Hey, can you? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Sure, we can do that. Yeah, the costly lessons. Let's talk yes. about thermal management for a minute. I had um, MB Allen from Kick on the show yep. a few months ago. And, and you know, they're real tight with oven manufacturers. And, and yes extracting data and perhaps even giving data back to the oven. And I watched a couple of your company's uh, videos um, this morning and yesterday. And uh, I, either you or one of your colleagues was talking about um, the ability for the oven to postpone starting until everything is back up to temperature. So, you know, obviously, right. you know, in today's modern technology, we have the ability to close loop everything um, in terms of information flow. What's the reason, I asked um, Kick the same question, but what's the reason there are thermal management companies and oven companies? Why aren't there oven companies with all that thermal management capability? Is it just, you know, a, such a specialty that it's best having, you know, experts in their field um, perform those functions? Or I've of, often wondered why there isn't a, um, a, you know, a thermal management device that just is part of the oven. You know, how come right. Heller doesn't buy kick or, or right. whoever, you know, name, name the name. Sure. You know, I, I think, uh, the, the issue is that, um, there's a little, well, credibility is a, is a good way to put it. You know, why doesn't the oven check its own work? Uh, well, process control says I'd rather have a third party, a, a box that you guys didn't make confirm your oven's performance uh oh, otherwise the oven would so, go and looks good to me <laughs> yep we're always good <laughs> always we're good look, perfect right yeah, it's always in green yeah and you know to a degree we all grew up in parallel kick um was making uh their their systems ecd as we were learning how to do ovens and they became established in parallel to us and it didn't seem uh, necessary or appropriate for uh, us to offer a product that was essentially as good or, or um, as a kick or an ECD or a solder star or any of the other products made throughout the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it has evolved into a reasonable, a reasonably stable uh, business. 
Yeah. Uh, they do what they do. Um, and we we're always happy to work closely with them. You know, we'll install their equipment on our machines at our factory or retrofit in the field as, as the customer asks. Oh, that makes sense. It's a, it's a specialty and it's a core competency issue. Yeah. And actually the software for prediction is not trivial. <laughs> no, I, that's, I mean, you, you can't just, I don't think start a profiling company and, and come up with those algorithms and those, those predictors that has to be based. I would imagine on lots of historical data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would be like, uh, you know, showing up in Vegas predicting when red 23 is going to land on the wheel at roulette. You know, it's, it's uh, right. You need to see the board and see what the history is and, and make an informed decision. It, 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 it would be hard to just show up there without any um, knowledge of history and odds and things like that and, and get that right. And, and that's probably way infinitely uh, easier than uh, thermal management and, and predictive technologies. Yes, yes. Let's talk about 4.0, Industry 4.0. That is a huge buzzword today. And I yes. I kind of blame you guys, not Heller, but I think it's that, that came out of the oven the need for ovens to talk to everything before it and after it, you know, I, right. I don't know if blame is the right word. Maybe credit would be a more positive way to say it. Um, I can, I, I can totally see the value of, of your type of equipment um, capturing data because you're the kind of the heart of the entire assembly industry. Um, everything is um, everything pre reflow is to get everything ready for reflow and everything after reflow is to clean up everything after reflow. And the reflow is just the, the center of the universe for assembly. Uh, and uh, so 4.0 seems to have kind of come out of that, that need. Uh, and uh, how has that landed on your industry and with competing standards and um, yes. protocols and, uh, and all of that, are, are, are you guys involved in the IPC uh, standards sure. and all that. Yeah, uh, Mark Peo, uh, our president, is uh, deeply involved with uh, uh, the standards, and uh, you know we the the two analogies would be either the Tower of Babel or the United <laughs> Nations General Assembly. Um, oh yeah, I can the, identify with the UN. I've been in some of those standards yeah. meetings, and it's it's yep. you know the saying is every country heard from. You know. Yep. So it, typically, what happens is. Um, customers love to have um, MES integrated MES systems, MIS systems. Um, they they would love to have all sorts of information, uh, and they particularly are happy when it's free. So the industry, I think, has come to expect that the pick and place company will supply software, and uh, everybody knows that software doesn't cost anything. So of course you should give it to me for <laughs> of free. Of course, software's free. It's the cost of uh, it's the cost of a thumb drive, right? It's, it's exactly. Cents. Yeah, really. No R and D so, at all. To a degree, um, we follow the lead of the pick and place companies, and we have to have uh, software that allows our machine to be compatible with a line set up with uh, the various brands. They tend to be similar but different. Uh, then there's the new standards, uh, Hermes or an IPC standard. So, uh, you know, we that's have... That's CFX? Is that what the C IPC yes, one CFX? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, we, we have essentially one or two ways to communicate. Uh, and then we uh, assign a, a front end or a, or a back end to that bit of hardware, or so, I mean, uh, software package, so that we can talk to the various uh, pick and place machines. Um, the, the other family of communication is sex gem, but that's almost all semiconductor okay. and very little of that's done in, uh, in surface mount. Uh, so the two standards today are Hermes and CFX, right? Uh, as I understand it, are, are they compatible yeah. standards? Are they competing stand? Is it, you know, VHS and Betamax or are they, are they closer <laughs> than that? But I, I would also argue there's a third Compete, uh, competition with um, entity, which would be the the in-house communication system sold by or uh, marketed by the pick and place companies. Mm. So we'll we'll have something that's compatible with the majors. Uh, so you have to build to and, at least three standards right now and be compatible oh, with easily. whatever they plug in. Yep. Will we come yeah, down and, to one? Do you think, or do you think they'll just um, the, the the will the market just whittle it down to one, or do you think there's enough? Um, need to have at least three different standards simultaneously. I, I, what is 
utterly is so interesting to me that we here in North America, we're thinking that, all right, the industry is coming to a consensus. And then all of a sudden, the, the Japanese uh, assembly industry came out with its own version of communication protocol, unbeknownst to the guys over here. <laughs> so it isn't consolidating. It's uh, it's expanding still. It, absolutely. Uh, we have proliferation. And that, I think, is the nature of our business. People are always seeking that uh, next two or three percent of advantage, uh, and they um, will. There's, there will always be new, better. I like mine better, so I'm going to use it. Uh, subgroups. Uh, so, you know, the the other thing that we we saw was that some of the large EMS companies were trying to develop their own in-house capability, and you know, even if they had three or four different pick and place platforms, they wanted one version for their entire company. And that has turned into an enormous challenge because you've got competing uh, centers of influence in these multinational companies and the Mexicans want this and the Europeans want that. And, but in China, they do come something completely different. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it is still spreading. Well, if this was easy, everyone would be making reflow ovens, right? So <laughs> yes. Maybe that's good. But but now, it's but a everyone in reflow now has a, a significantly larger software team than they had five years ago. Sure, right. I mean, it used to be a mechanical company, right? You you yes. bolted yes. things together and yeah. had a PLC that that or or a, a PC or whatever that ran the show. Now now you're you're almost like an IT company. Very much so. Yeah, that has that has changed. So what are the most, this is one of my favorite questions, um, just, you know, from curiosity, uh, what are some of the most common mistakes made when either selecting or using a reflow oven from your perspective? I think that the, the, the one area where people can get into trouble is when they look at their reflow oven as one size fits all and try to run pretty much everything through one profile. Because they're, they're, it's almost true, but it isn't completely true. And it's not true enough of the time so that you, you can't do that. You really ought to profile similar boards of, of similar thermal mass uh, because every now and then there'll be something that you didn't think of and it's a gotcha. And then you've got a, uh, a cold joint or some other issue. Uh, and uh, I think the critical thing is to, to do one's homework and profile new assemblies uh, and invest the time just to make sure everything is, is quite good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. In my business, uh, the post reflow cleaning industry, I have some pet peeves and it doesn't take much to get me on a soapbox and, and complain. But uh, one of them is when a so-called manufacturer sells a relabeled dishwasher or a glassware washer, or uh. a, calling it a circuit board cleaner. And you know, they rarely work well and they leave, uh, a less than confident impression on the entire cleaning industry, casting a shadow on, on, on everybody in this industry, the good guys, the bad guys, everyone in the middle. Uh, are there any pet peeves when it comes to the reflow industry? This is your chance to get on a soapbox and, and kind of bitch and, bitch and moan <laughs> a little bit about, about your industry and, and specifically, is there anything that just drives you crazy? Um, I, I, I think that uh, at the very low end, there are some machines that technically work, um, but only in a very, very small subset of all possibilities. Very low throughput, uh, very simple boards, uh, and for a relatively short period of time, uh, you know, most production equipment is made to a far more robust standard. Uh, but every now and then I'll see a, a, a limited production system that is very inexpensive uh, and think, oh, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, that's the one that, uh, that gets me. Well, you have your version of dishwashers in your industry. Um, I've seen what look like toaster ovens um, yes. with modified controllers on them being sold as reflow machines. And yep. You know, nothing moves. It's totally batch. And I would imagine maybe they ramp up and ramp down and whatever. But um, they they do look uh, remarkably like, um, you know, something you would see, you know, the word Maytag on or, or Sunbeam or, or some, some retail thing. Oh, 
Yeah, in the cleaner business for sure. There, there's sometimes I'll open it up and go, "This is a dishwasher, isn't it?" Yeah, I mean, right. yeah. You know? we see those every day. Yeah, and and you know, ironically, sometimes they work. You know, because because the yeah. application is very easy, and so yep. you know, people think it works, and well, they they're going to buy it because they wouldn't be selling it if it didn't work. But that's not always true in our industry. Yes, as, as yes. we all know. Looking forward, you know, this podcast is all about reliability. Um, do you have any specific concerns over reliability in general in the entire assembly process? I know the auto industry is concerned about reliability because they're talking about uh, ramping up the voltage on on um, yes in cars to a thousand volts, even twelve hundred volts, uh, and, yes. and there's this debate about you know high voltage, low current, or the other way around, and and. Uh, the, the margin for error is very, very low when you're running that much voltage through a board uh, for a, a lot of different reasons. So do you see our industry moving forward in a way that, that concerns you with, uh, re with regard to reliability? You know, the, I would say that in general, the solder paste uh, and the complementary technology has evolved so that the assembly process is extremely robust. Um, the area, though, that where we see people starting to worry is automotive, as you said. And then that branches into two areas. One of them is the, the power handling, um, where, as you've said, the voltages are going higher. Um, you know, we're thinking of silicon carbide components. Uh, that'll be 600, 1,000 volts. Uh, the currents are really high. Uh, the other area is in uh, autonomous uh, driving, where essentially you've got the electronics of a jet fighter at the uh, <laughs> mounted inside your car. Right. You've got LIDAR and radar and high-speed communication. And what we're seeing there is that um, the uh, risk of uh, uh, voids is now being taken really seriously because it'll change the impedance of the circuit sufficiently that it's not consistent anymore. So whereas people were pretty casual about voids for, you know, the first 35, 40 years of, of surface mount, now it, it, here's an application where it really matters. Uh, you know, you can argue that voids are not super critical for BGAs. Occasionally, you'll get into trouble. Um, some Dave Hillman did some real good work at uh, Rockwell Collins. Uh, some other folks at uh, Lucent uh, have done excellent work there. You know, but here's a case where uh, it's there's no doubt people want to make sure there are no voids uh, in in that, se that segment of the automotive uh, circuit assembly area. Sure, and you brought up a, a concern in the early days of reflow that there was a uh, just uh, a wide uh, variation of component sizes and masses on a board. Yes, I, I'm. I'm thinking that you know Tesla and uh, whoever. I just use Tesla as a as a generic you know electric car example. Uh, I've you know I've seen some of their boards and and there is a mixture of large power devices and QFNs on the same board and with very yes. large traces because they're running all this yes. current through it. That has got to present. Uh, some new challenges, even more so than maybe the early days, in terms of the um, the, the the variation in mass on an assembly, and you know areas of the board that could be overheated or underheated, depending upon what they're trying to protect. Is that is that something that's come back again, or is that just an evolution of of normal electronics today? I think that uh, Tesla is an excellent example of some very challenging hardware. Um, it, the they also, I think, would will benefit from uh, a vacuum process to devoid uh, their critical solder joints. The autonomous uh, control systems that uh, you were describing, made by Tesla and, and uh, Supercruise, others, it's a enormous potential liability issue for the automakers. You know, should something go wrong. And, you know, how much are you willing to spend to make sure that the uh, board is built with the utmost reliability? And the, the answer is quite a bit. They'll do whatever it takes to make sure that these are reliable. Uh, so it justifies a lot of special handling, and like vacuum reflow, like uh, extensive cleaning. 
uh, just to make sure there's you've take out every opportunity for a, a failure. Yeah, I, I've said this on this show before, but the the technology in a car has morphed from entertainment to safety as more drivers are relying on adaptive cruise control or lane departure warnings or blind spot indicators, uh, not to even mention autonomous driving. Uh, we, we are becoming worse drivers because we're relying on this technology. You know, we don't look <laughs> over our shoulder. I, what, the first car sure. I got with blind spot indicators, I, I would look over my shoulder and look at the blind spot indicator just to, so I had a gut feeling that they're both you know, in sync. There's truly nothing there. Yes. The first uh, time I had, a, I bought a car uh, recently, last year, that has adaptive cruise control that uses LiDAR or some technology like that. Um, you know, whenever I got close to somebody, my foot was over the brake just in case the computer didn't yes. catch it. And, and it hasn't failed me yet. But the, you know, BMW uh, just last year, 2018, uh, recalled a whole bunch of cars on their electric model, their i whatever, i3, i8, whatever, whatever they call it. Yeah. And, um, you know, they had a there was a cleaning issue and and their um, their method of protecting the driver when their systems found some board wasn't working properly was to immediately shut down the car, which was their way of protecting the driver. Well, if I was on the fast lane passing somebody or whatever, and all of a sudden my car turned off, um, <laughs> that's not cool. You know, that could put wow. me in more danger. And that reminds yes. me, and I've said this on the show before, so my apologies to the audience who've heard this before. Um, you know, they, they came up with a software fix for a hardware problem. And, and yes. not too long ago, Boeing tried that uh, with disastrous results. So, you know, it, it, we just need to build it right the first time. And unlike the aviation industry, we don't have the benefit of three main computers as, uh, for redundancy. We have to have one, and it has to always work. So every connection needs to be solid. Every um, software uh, uh, program needs to be thoroughly vetted. And, and it's, it's no longer a case where we don't get to listen to XM radio if, if something fails. Now um, it may mistake... Uh, something that's not in front of us for something that is in front of us or, and, 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 you know, slam on the brakes when it shouldn't or not slam on the brakes when it should. I mean, our lives are at stake with this uh, reliability expectation. And then we're, this whole IOT thing is a little bit crazy. You know, we're putting electronics and things merely because we can, not because we really need to. And, you know, when, when IOT explodes it's this, as it's doing now and it will continue to do so over the next coming years, uh, we tend to take electronics out with us and the whole nature of IOT, everything is a connected device. And we go into harsh environments and we drag our electronics into harsh environments. And, and it, it really is uh, testing the bounds of reliability and, and uh, in the electronic industry. Uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. There's a lot of talk right now about trade tariffs and our trade war um, against China and the reciprocal trade war that China has. You know, our yes. equipment going into China, we don't build in China, but our equipment going into China is suddenly 25% more expensive, you know? Yes. Um, and, you know, we're, we, we don't really have a horse in that race. You build not just in China, but you, I think you build in Korea as well. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So did you shift production um, to Korea? Yes. Oh, oh, smart move. So there's, yeah. your equipment is not subject to any of the tariffs coming into That's this right. country. That's right. Because yes. it's built in Korea. Yeah. You know, when when the rules came out, it's it was as if somebody had it in for our business because one of the SIC codes was very, very specific about, you know, solder reflow ovens used to assemble printed circuit boards. They could <laughs> oh, not have been any more specific. <laughs> right. Right. Everything else is very generic and yours is very specific. Yes. Um, well, that probably helps protect some of the... Uh, companies there that are building um, reflow ovens, but it, but it does uh, also affect even people who aren't buying ovens from China. You know, it affects companies like us uh, that are selling to China uh, because yes. uh, all of a sudden we're we're in the war and yes, you know, we didn't start it and and we don't really uh, have a horse in that race. But it's a uh, it's a regrettable thing, and this is not a political show, um, so I, I won't make it one. But um, I think. Some people in the higher levels of the government forget who pays tariffs. And, yes. you know, we yes. pay the tariffs. We taxpayers in the United States pay the tariffs if we buy something that's made uh, in a country where we impose tariffs. It's not a tax on the manufacturer. It's a tax on the buyer. And Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, uh, 
it may be raising all this money from you know for the government, but we might as well just write checks to the government because <laughs> it's the same right. effect. Uh, so I, I think one way or the other, and I've said this before, one way or the other, this is going to be resolved in a, a relatively quick manner. It, it just can't go the direction it's going. Um, we are a global economy, and I have no problem with uh, things being built all over the world. Um, you know, we are well past uh, a monolithic uh, society. We are we are global in nature. So. Every, you know, in our equipment, there are things made from all over that go into our equipment, even though we make it yes. here. You know, there's certain things we just can't source here because it's just not made. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm a big believer in buy local and then if you can't, extend the reach. Uh, but um, uh, certainly that's something that is landing on the electronics industry between components and equipment and, and things like that. Um, that, that really uh, is, uh, is, a little scary and uh, a little disappointing, but um, hopefully that'll be resolved soon. Yeah, I, I agree deeply with uh, that the philosophy of free trade, but I also understand that uh, there are certain practices that were, uh, shall we say, not fair. Clearly. Needed clearly. to be yeah. uh, evolved. Um, I, I, yeah, I might have created a, uh, a different tact for applying pressure yeah. because... Uh, the, the way that we did it uh, from a, uh, a single point may not have been the most effective. But I, I hope that you're right that it gets resolved soon. Uh, I hope so. I, but I think it will, I, but I have I no worry. basis for that. I just have a gut that it will be, you know, insanity. You know, once everything, you know, once every side keeps raising the stakes at some point, um, that that will break. And, yeah. uh, you know, everyone needs yeah. to just go back and, do their business <laughs> and yes <laughs> sort of that all that can be cleared out of the way the better and then we can concentrate on the reasons behind them uh separately yes. and and more effectively yes. and more focused than just throwing these large number tariffs out on everybody that just it just causes the chinese people to to pay more money and the american people to pay more money and and yeah um it, it doesn't really resolve the problem um at least from this vantage point but yeah at any rate, well, that's good for you that that uh, you're able to shift production to another one of your facilities. So you have three facilities, right? You're, uh, uh, am I right in saying New Jersey? Is that one of them? Yes. Okay. Yeah, New Jersey was our original facility, and we re retain all of our engineering for the uh, the semiconductor products, uh, and then China and Korea. Uh, and uh, the the each group has its own roughly equally sized engineering department. Wow, what an enterprise. So thank you, David, for being my guest on the show. Uh, it's been very interesting. I love the topic of reflow. As I said earlier, I think that's kind of the heart of the electronic assembly industry. Um, pick and place guys might have a have a feud with that <laughs> statement, but that's okay. Sure. They're big. They can handle that. But uh, exactly. thank you for uh, agreeing to be on the show. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge, and, and uh, I like the insight, all the insight that you've given on, on the whole topic of reflow. Uh, Mike, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast. Reliability Matters and other reliability-based podcasts are available at Circuit Assembly's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and at Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm. Thanks for your comments. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to Mike at MikeConrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.